topics, and very competently, by the way. A lot of people cover a lot of topics. They don't do it necessarily competently. But here we have a person that has the breadth and has the depth. She's, she's amazing. She's an old, old town, old, old time and old, uh, you know, hometown favorite because she was a Baltimore girl for a long time. And without any further ado, Rosemary Ellen Guiley. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sue. A pleasure to be back again this year. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk from down here because I like to see my computer uh, as opposed to craning my neck on the stage a lot. And Now the description uh, today in the program is um, not quite what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I am going to be mentioning the gentleman on the program, Ray Hernandez, but my topic it really is much broader than that and it's this, the uh, new alien ET experiencers. For the past couple of years, I've been involved in a research project with an organization to um, examine the whole spectrum of uh, experiencer entity contact, not just ETs, but um, energy beings, spirit guides, angels, ghosts, mysterious creatures, the whole gamut, although we are focusing primarily on ET experiencers. And we have uh, conducted a study that's groundbreaking. It's the first of its kind. And in many ways, it rewrites the map on what we think we know about entity contact experience. And that's because the media only really give us a portion, uh, a kind of a narrow perspective of what contact really is. And of course, as we all know, fear plays in the media. And so a lot of the negative experiences get all the press. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is um, what is really going on in terms of contact? And who are the people who are having these, these experiences? And what does it mean for the rest of us? Because the implications are very far reaching. And it's far deeper than, uh, for example, uh, having a one-off experience that makes you wonder uh, about things for the rest of your life and goes into the odd bin. Uh, these are experiences that are life transforming, soul transforming, and they're affecting all of us. And that in turn is going to affect the 3D reality that we are in now. So, oh, Ed told me not to do that. <laughs> uh, so if we could have the lights down, Ed, please. And um, I, I hope you can all see okay if I stand here. First, I'd just like to give a shout out to uh, artist David Chase. Some of you may know David Chase. He's been in the Experiencer community for quite a few years. He is a fabulous artist. He lives in Seattle. I've, I grew up in Seattle. I go out there every year. I've uh, had uh, uh, meetings with him. We're going to be seeing him again this summer. David Chase is very much involved in the same research that I am doing. And so many of the illustrations that you see today have been supplied by David. In fact, he's doing a lot more original artwork for the research project. This is the organization. It's called the Edgar Mitchell, Dr. Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Encounters. It's not very old. Uh, the genesis for this happened just a few years ago, and I came on board uh, not quite two years ago. Uh, and uh, this organization now is uh, responsible for groundbreaking research that really resets the bar on what we know about entity contact experience. And it started with this man, Ray Hernandez. Ray lives in Florida. He is uh, an attorney for the IRS. Makes some people think that the government has already infiltrated us, but um, actually, uh, in this field, uh, if uh, you haven't been accused of working for the government and spreading disinformation, you really haven't earned your badge, I guess. But at any rate, Ray is an experiencer and a lifelong experiencer, so are members of his family. And he had one day a download experience. And uh, this is a term now that we're hearing a little more often. I had a download experience back in the 80s where I felt infused at a high rate of speed uh, of information and knowledge from um, a being. And at that time, I called the being an angel because I didn't know what else to call it. Uh, but uh, who knows exactly uh, what that being was. But the download came after uh, a series of um, astral plane instructions that would take place during lucid dreaming. But back to Ray's experience. Uh, Ray is driving along in his car one day and he has an altered state experience where he seems swept out of the normal time-space continuum into a matrix reality that is like being on a ferris wheel of revolving cosmic lights. 
and uh, as he seems to be in the center of, of this maelstrom going on, and these lights start coalescing into uh, what he can see are modalities of contact. These are all the different ways and methods that human beings have contact with non-human intelligent beings, with higher realities, with transcendent realities. And he's like on this revolving wheel, seeing them all and getting an incredible amount of information about them all at the same time. And with that came an instruction that he had to act on this. He had to do something about it. Uh, and uh, what happened after that were an amazing series of synchronicities. I think we've all had times in our lives when things have just m almost magically fallen into place. It's like a destiny that's meant to be. And so that's what happened with Ray. And uh, so he started doing what seemed to be the impossible to many people. And the first person he contacts is Dr. Edgar Mitchell. And uh, Dr. Mitchell, uh, as many of you know, had a deeply spiritual side to him. And he, he had um, um, some experiences that really fall into uh, these paraphysical, mystical uh, contact uh, realm. And he is the uh, founder of the Institute for Noetic Sciences out in California to explore these realities and also uh, how to bridge science to these realities. And uh, Dr. Mitchell was very enthusiastic about um, Ray's experience and Ray wanted to found an organization uh, to focus on the bridge building. Uh, to look for scientific ways to explain these modalities of contact and also to explore the modalities themselves. Uh, Ray's feeling being that we only see the tip of the iceberg and that tip of the iceberg that we see is often not a very accurate one. So uh, on goes the, the uh, trail of synchronicities and he brings in Dr. Rudy Schild who is a professor emeritus from Harvard. He's an astrophysicist and has done groundbreaking theoretical work on black holes. Now talk about a bridge man. We don't find uh, scientists very often willing to go into the paraphysical side of things. Uh, but uh, Dr. Schild believes that black holes may be the explanation for the Akashic records. And that is something that we are going to be exploring on down in another phase of, uh, of free work. So Rudy Schild gets on board. And uh, then Ray contacts Mary Rodwell, who is probably uh, Ms. UFO Australia. Uh, Mary is uh, one of the central figures in ufology research and experiencer contact experiences down under, and she's immediately on board. So Free is formed, and uh, we have a board of directors, um, which consists now of these individuals. It's an international board. There's, of course, Ray, Rudy, uh, Mary Rodwell, John Klimo is a professor of psychology. Uh, some of you might be familiar with his groundbreaking work on channeling and also afterlife communications. He did a fabulous co-authored book on communications from suicide not, uh, not long ago. Bob Davis is a neuroscientist. Giorgio Piacenza is a physicist from Peru. There's myself. Illebrand Ludwiger is a German physicist. Uh, Leo Sprinkle, many of you recognize that name from experiencer research and especially abduction uh, research. And Kathleen Marden, who's the director of research for MUFON. Now, Leo Sprinkle just recently tendered his resignation uh, for a lot of personal reasons. And uh, right now, Kathleen Marden is on a leave of absence. She has a new book coming out, and uh, she's gearing up for quite a publicity campaign. So she's uh, stepped aside for a few months. But this is the board of directors. We also have a research committee. I'm uh, deeply involved in that. And we have a lot of other satellite uh, committees around us. <coughs> the primary focus of uh, FREE was to do this survey, something that no other organization or individual had ever done before. And uh, now keep in mind that uh, most of the surveys that we have done uh, in this field have been based on very small population samples, 50 to 150 people. Even Ken Ring's uh, dynamite survey from 1992 comparing UFO experiencers and NDE experiencers um, only consisted of about 150 people. Uh, but we were going to do something much bigger and on a global scale in multiple languages. So uh, we sent out notices to 500 Facebook sites, to MUFON, to all state directors of MUFON, 
2,500 emails to individuals and organizations and did a lot of internet promotion to get people to be aware of the study and to participate in it. This is a self-selected study. Uh, and uh, we weren't just asking a dozen questions uh, or even 100 questions, we were asking 600 questions. So that's a lot of work and uh, I uh, have a great big thanks to all the people who participated in this. I took the survey myself as an experiencer and uh, it, it took a while to go through all 600 questions. The uh, survey was con uh, formatted on SurveyMonkey. It was designed by academics, primarily Klimo and Davis. And we ran it for about a year, phase one and phase two. <coughs> the uh, respondents, there we go. Uh, more than 2,700 individuals from 63 countries. Now you consider that to the 50 to 150 population samples that had provided data about entity contact experiences in the past, and you can see that we are dealing with a much bigger picture of the population. 63 countries, most of them of course in the US, UK, and Australia, where most of the publicity took place. Uh, most of the respondents were female, uh, which didn't surprise anybody because women are more, more likely to uh, participate in this sort of thing. Um, most of them fell in a middle-aged age range, as you can see, ages 45 to 64. And when we asked professions, the largest category came from arts, entertainment, sports, and the media, uh, which also isn't too surprising when you consider that individuals in those professions are altered state oriented anyway. They're uh, creative, they're in the zone, um, and that can often predispose an individual to have uh, contact experiences. Um, interestingly, um, the great majority of them had experienced out-of-body uh, episodes, and um, approximately a third of them, a little over a third, had had near-death experiences. That's something that we're exploring in more detail, the connection between ET experiences and near-death experiences. There are um, a lot of links there. So uh, just to give you an idea of the framework before we get into some of the surprising results from uh, this survey, uh, there were two phases, 150 questions, 450 questions, 600 altogether. We asked far-ranging questions. What are the types of beings you encountered? How often have you interacted with them? How did you communicate with them? Were you ever on board a craft? Did you ever see a craft operated? Were you ever given science or technology? Did you ever talk about God? Had you ever been abducted against your will? Uh, was there any connection to spiritual topics? How were you changed by this? Um, we're going to be looking at just some of the significant highlights of that today where most of the surprises came in. Now in phases three and four, we're involved in that now where we're going back to this original pool to ask more open-ended questions. These were all multiple choice questions and not everybody answered every question because not every question applied. And um, uh, many respondents, of course, felt limited by the choices involved. There, there wasn't any other you could check with a little explanation to it. So in phase three and four, we're going back with open-ended questions where people can provide written answers. And um, some of the ones that we've been getting already go on for pages. People are almost writing books about uh, the details of their experiences. And in phase four, we're going to ask individuals uh, who might be willing to come forward and be interviewed one-on-one -on, -one on a camera. So uh, I'm involved right now in phase three going through uh, these uh, results to uh, select uh, candidates for a more in-depth uh, interviewing. The parameters, uh, how did we decide what kinds of experiences we were going to look at, well, the foundation of them. Uh, we placed, uh, placed the greatest em emphasis on conscious experience and recall, followed by uh, altered states of consciousness, meditation, lucid dreaming, <coughs> out-of-body projection, near-death experience, and although we collected experiences based on hypnotic regression, we're not giving them uh, as much weight, not because those are not valid experiences, but we have no way of controlling the quality of how those regressions took place. And uh, as you know, uh, when someone is under hypnosis, 
Um, if a regression isn't done very well, uh, somebody can be led to give certain answers. So just because we had no quality control over the process, we have given those uh, less attention. So conscious recall. And uh, surprisingly, uh, many people are fully conscious when they have their contact experiences. So uh, after going through all of this data, uh, then it was made available to people on the board in December. Uh, and when I started going through it, uh, 600 questions, pages and pages of data for every question, um, probably easily at least 2,000 pages of data, I was very surprised at some of the results uh, and very excited by them. And I want to share with you some of those uh, significant findings. But first, before we get into that, let's take a look at where we are with our stereotypes. Uh, this is what uh, we're often dealing with when um, uh, books come out, uh, when films come out, when television programs are done. What kind of stereotypes are presented to us about typical entity contact experience, especially ET? Well, there's the unhappy abduction. You are forcibly taken against your will. It's a nasty experience. You're prodded, poked, um, and sometimes in very painful way. You are traumatized. And this becomes a, a cycle of experiences that you have no control over. Uh, and I'm not saying that these do not happen. They do happen. Uh, but this has become a stereotype in the media that if you're going to encounter an alien, it's probably going to be under these circumstances. And as big a fan as I was of X-Files, they certainly uh, pushed that one too. Well, the aliens are here to take us over. This is Battle of Los Angeles. They're going to come in big warships and they're going to you know, shoot us all to pieces without explanation. In that movie, there's never any explanation for who the aliens are, why they're here, and why they're blowing us to bits. Uh, but they just march in with their ships and start annihilating us. That's another stereotype. Or they invade us from within. They're really ugly, evil, shapeshifters, reptilians, and they've come to suck our blood and eat our flesh. Um, and um, maybe they're going to cook us up for a gourmet meal. Love that one, Twilight Zone. Have another cookie, Mr. Smith. You're not weighing enough here. But uh, we, you know, we have these ideas that, in other words, Dealing with the aliens is going to be trouble for us. And, uh, you know, in some respects, I think it is, because uh, just look at people on the planet. You know, we have good guys and we have bad guys and a lot of people in between. And I'm sure it is with the aliens, too. But these are stereotypes that uh, have been reinforced to, uh, uh, to us uh, through the media for many years. <clears throat> so some of these significant findings, then, that uh, um, make you uh, wonder what's really going on in the encounter phenomenon experience. Who are the aliens? So we ask people, what sort of beings did you encounter? Did you interact with? Did you see? And uh, we gave them a number of categories. And of course, most people will say, well, it's got to be these guys. Uh, it's got to be those grays, because that's all we ever see on a book cover these days and, and in a TV show. Now, uh, before the 1980s, and um, here we have, you know, that's uh, from Whitley Strieber's book. Um, if you looked at drawings from ET contactees, um, the, the entities were all over the map in terms of their description. In fact, you could almost say that uh, you were reading a fairy book from uh, some of the descriptions. They're just all sorts of sizes and shapes. And then along uh, around the 1980s, then we have the standardization of ET contact, which is the little gray guy. And so uh, everybody seems to be talking about the little gray guys. They're abducting people all over the place. And uh, these and also the reptilians, they're the ones that you're likely to encounter. Well, not so. Uh, the respondents, the majority of our respondents, the largest single category was energy beings. Uh, now, mind you, we're dealing a lot with labels. And uh, what is one person's angel is going to be another person's ET is going to be another person's energy being. So what, uh, what, what the respondents are saying, what they're telling back to us in terms of the characteristics of their contact experiences is that sometimes we may not be able to put a specific label on something. We're groping as best as we can to describe these beings. They're others. They are definitely others. They are definitely alien. And they come from another world besides ours. So the biggest single category was energy beings. And uh, some of those uh, you know, have a humanoid look. And some of them are various patterns. They're like pillars of light, shapes of light, balls of light, impressions. 
uh, with an intelligence behind it, they could uh, be expressed in many, many different ways. After that comes the humanoids. Bring on the Space Brothers again. You know, those tall blonde ones, the Nordics. Uh, this is the second biggest single category, humanoid beings. And there's a big overlap between the humanoid beings and the energy beings because sometimes these humanoids seem to be shrouded in envelopes and auras of energy. Uh, they seem to be vibrating at a very different level than, uh, than we are. Now after that come the grays. And uh, if you look at the gray, the two categories of the grays, the, uh, the short grays at a little over 50% and the tall grays at 32%, well, they kind of outweigh everybody else, but not everybody uh, reported um, those uh, together as the most dominant uh, form of entity that they were uh, dealing with. And uh, they're pretty close behind the energy beings and the humanoids. You know, they're all kind of running neck and neck here for, uh, for attention. After that comes spirit forms and ghosts. And this was the best way that people, again, could describe the, uh, what we call non-human intelligent being that they have encountered. Um, and uh, sometimes people had the feeling that they were talking with uh, someone who had been from the human realm who had passed on and others just some sort of spirit form, like perhaps uh, something from the astral plane. After that come human-alien hybrids, um, dropping way down to about 26%. Personally, I do think we have hybrids on the planet, uh, and many people believe that as well. And um, about a quarter of our respondents said they felt that they had encountered them. Uh, following that, the reptilian humanoids. Uh, the reptilians get a lot of press as well because they're very exotic and dramatic and many people fear reptiles and so it evokes a very primitive fear within us to feature something about them. But actually, uh, most of the reptilians that um, people reported being in contact with were um, non-violent, non-aggressive, non-hostile uh, kinds of beings. After that, one of my favorite categories, the insectoids. Uh, insectoids of all kinds. The praying mantises have uh, gotten a lot of attention, but uh, people have described um, insectoid beings of all shapes. I had uh, one contactee who described, um, uh, he said it filled this entire doorway. And he said it had the body of what looked like a cricket. Uh, and it had, uh, seemed to have like cricket-like wings folded on its back that uh, shimmered and looked rather metallic. It had a bird-like face with a parrot-like beak on it. It had human thighs and human forearms, but they ended in little insectoid kinds of uh, ends. And um, he said that it was a, a rather formidable, rather frightening figure. It filled up his, uh, his entire doorway of his room and came along with some little gray guys in, in hoods uh, as part of his experience. So um, sometimes these beings are amalgams of things that we perceive. And it may be our ability to perceive them that then determines what it is exactly we're seeing. And then uh, the last category, animal types. And uh, Bigfoot would fall into this, or um, again, mixtures of animals like dogmen, uh, or animal-like things that would have animal-like legs and bodies, small animal types at 14.51% uh, and large animal types like Bigfoot at 12.9%. Now there is a very strange relationship between sightings of Bigfoot and sightings of craft in the sky and UFO activity that uh, is underexplored in ufology and cryptozoology as well. It seems like the two fields don't want to tread on um, uh, the ground on the other side, but there's a connection there that the meaning of which uh, remains to be determined. It really does need to be researched. So some of the notable characteristics of con uh, contact, um, Sam was talking about some of these earlier today about, uh, you know, they usually involve telepathy, um, experiencers feel transported into a matrix reality. Uh, they're 
uh, sometimes aware of this reality and aware of another reality. It's like a blurring or a blending or they feel completely transported to something that is very much a bridge world or in between. Sleep paralysis is involved in uh, most of the cases as well. A lot of these take place uh, during lucid dreaming or uh, people wake up and uh, they're paralyzed in bed while some sort of experience or encounter takes place. Uh, a significant number said that they felt that they had, had some sort of healing as a result of their experience, a little over 41 percent. Now, these are some of the generalities, and I'm only hitting a few of the, uh, the highlights from these. Um, the majority of the respondents said that their experiences were pleasant and they wouldn't change them even if they could. So we're not having uh, a bulk of terrifying experiences. Not that those don't happen. There were plenty of people who had painful experiences, uh, who were frightened by them, but the majority of our respondents said their experiences were pleasant, they were treated with respect by the aliens, they felt even on an, an equal basis with them. The uh, alien, over 90 percent said the aliens were definitely not evil, the ones that they dealt with. In all of these categories, they had never been hurt by them. Uh, they had personalities and were playful. They weren't mono, uh, monotone little robots running around. Uh, and that they felt that they had reached some sort of agreement with the aliens, even though they couldn't articulate it. They didn't quite know what it was. And when we asked if, uh, do you know what that agreement was, it was a yes or no question without an opportunity to uh, provide detail on that. But they felt that there was some purpose for this contact that um, they might not be able to put a finger on, but um, there was something, it was like there was something in it for both sides. It wasn't just a one-way kind of street. And now some of the other generalities, and, and these were some of the negatives. Uh, we have people saying, oh, the aliens are here to save us. No, they're here to kill us. They're here to breed with us. They're here to warn us about earth catastrophe. They're here to save us from ourselves. It's like we, we want them all to be little gingerbread cookie uh, people all doing the same thing, all of the same mind. We want it black and white, and there's no black and white when it comes to any of these areas. So the majority of our respondents said uh, the aliens don't say who they are or where they're from. Uh, they don't say why they're here or why they have targeted certain individuals for contact. The majority said they have not been given advanced science and technology, uh, and that ranges around in the 70 percent range. So that means that there are 30 some percent of people who are getting information, but it not, does not seem to be a dominant purpose of a lot of contact experiences. They also said the aliens are not here. To, they, they get no warnings of catastrophes of Earth, how we're damaging the environment, uh, that they're here to help, help save us from ourselves. Um, they do not uh, talk about genetics, breeding programs, human DNA. Uh, we've had stories about the aliens saying that um, their genetics are in poor shape and they need an infusion of human genetics, they need human blood, or humans have emotions and they don't and they need something from us. Those may be motives in some kinds of cases, but they are not dominant ones. Uh, and um, the aliens also do not comment about God. <clears throat> now when the aliens do identify where they're from, now remember this is a minority, uh, we did ask the question, what star system do they say they're from? And this is the breakdown. Um, after the Pleiades, at 17, a little over 17 percent, it gets pretty well uh, distributed in very low percentages between Sirius, Arcturus, Orion, Zeta Reticuli, if you recall, that was the Benny and Barney Hill uh, abduction experience, Andromeda, Lyra, and over 50 percent of them simply fell into other. Um, Maybe the aliens said where they were from, but nobody knew where that was. Uh, nobody on the Earth side knew how to interpret that. I want to focus just for a minute on abductions, because abductions have received so much attention over the decades. And uh, only about a third of our respondents said they had been forcibly taken against their will. And uh, even, the, even if they had been taken against their will, most of them said that it was not uh, an entirely unpleasant experience. Um, and in fact, only a little over 8 percent said that their experiences were mostly negative. Uh, so what happens to the other 90-some percent? Uh, they're not probed and prodded. They're not terrified. They're not subjugated to, uh, to something. What goes on with these abductions? 
And uh, sometimes people don't know what goes on abduction, uh, with abductions because they have no recall. They know that they've been taken somewhere, they have missing time, and they do not know what has transpired during that. Uh, of the ones who said they'd been abducted, uh, just a little over 40% said they knew they were participating in a breeding program, but they didn't know why. Uh, they didn't know the purpose of it. They felt uh, that they had had some sort of hybrid children, but they had not ever been presented with those children and told that they were hybrids. Uh, there's been a lot of attention focused on RH blood. And uh, in fact, uh, there's been a, a sentiment for years now that uh, repeated abductees, including families, multilineal uh, generational uh, lines of abductees, have RH negative <coughs> blood. And um, most of the people that we surveyed um, said no, they did not. So I think we need to reevaluate what's going on there with the RH negative factor, how significant it is. Uh, a little over a third of the people said they didn't even know what their blood type was, but uh, slightly under half said no, they knew they were not RH negative. And those are among the abductees. So uh, what can we say about the purposes and the messages of the visitors? If, uh, if, if they're not polarized in some way, to uh, either um, pull our chestnuts out of the fire or do us in. Uh, and they don't talk about God, and they don't talk about science or earth warnings uh, or genetics, then what are they here for? Well, um, over half of our respondents had a message that the nuts and bolt people are not going to like very much at all. In fact, it's going to probably make a little, uh, some of them cringe a little. It's this, love and oneness. Um, now, what people meant by that was we asked them, uh, did you get a message of love uh, from, uh, from the um, non-human intelligent beings, which is a term uh, we used as well as uh, ETs or entities. And uh, in elaborating on this uh, through subsequent questions, um, people said, and this ties in with the fact that they felt that they had been treated by respect, that they were on an equal basis uh, with uh, the entities, that they were playful, they were not evil, overwhelmingly not evil, that they had personalities, and that um, the whole meaning of some contact experience seemed to be this transmission of love and oneness. Now, that sounds very uh, new agey to a lot of people, uh, but when you think about it, it is quite significant because uh, uh, if we are significant players in the cosmos and if we have free will and determination and we are to be a meaningful part of the cosmic whole, everything that is, uh, wouldn't we need to raise the level of our consciousness to a higher level? Uh, and in metaphysics, it is the search for love, for unconditional love and to be part of the oneness, everything that is. And if having a contact experience with a non-human intelligent being instills that feeling in a human being, isn't that significant? Isn't that more important than a lot of other things? Now we have a lot of agendas going on on this planet. Uh, we are by no means of single mind or purpose and I do not believe that we can say that of the aliens. They're not all marching around to a single beat and a single drummer. So we do have, uh, I believe, uh, hostile beings who are here to take advantage of us, to use us, to mine us, to get something from us, uh, as well as others on the other side. But here we have the majority of our experiencers saying that contact is a good thing. It's beneficial uh, and it brings a transformation of body, mind, and spirit. So as a result of their experiences, and now most of our experiences said that they had interacted with non-human intelligent beings uh, 20 times or more. That was our biggest category, uh, followed down by um, uh, like five to 10 times and uh, one, once or twice. We didn't have uh, that many that were just kind of one-off experiences. That people said that they felt permanently changed by these experiences. They became uh, aware of overlapping realities. Uh, they became more psychic, and in fact, uh, precognition was the thing cited most. They had started having more precognitive experiences. They became more sensitive to others, more empathic. And they also became more aware of these other beings. In other words, once you got a few pickles out of the jar with contact experiences, other contact experiences became easier to have. 
and uh, flashes of cosmic awareness, uh, over 60% of them having um, bursts of uh, transcendent reality that would be akin to experiences described uh, metaphysically when one studies yoga uh, or meditation for an intense period of time. So here we are sort of on a short track here of transformation of consciousness by merely by having contact experience with otherworldly visitors. Uh, they also said that they felt physically changed by it, that their nervous systems seemed to be different. There was a new energy going through their bodies. They could feel energy in their hands, like healing energy, where they had not had that before. And they had an improved ability to learn. Well, you know what this sounds like? It sounds like, here again, a kundalini awakening. And this is something that happens to you after a long and intense period of spiritual study unless you happen to have a, a severe trauma. You can also have a, a kundalini awakening. But the kundalini awakening is a psycho-spiritual energy that in yoga lies coiled uh, in an energy center at the base of the spine. And it's aligned along the path of the chakras. And each chakra, of course, not only has a physical function, but uh, a higher consciousness kind of function until you get up to the crown, which is uh, a stage of enlightenment. And uh, someone following the path of yoga can spend uh, the better part of a lifetime seeking a kundalini awakening. Although the kundalini awakening is not sought for its own purpose, it's sort of a byproduct of spiritualizing the consciousness. And a whole lot of other things happen with that, uh, that if you have, um, uh, there are varying degrees of kundalini awakening. If you have uh, a kundalini awakening, you become more psychic, more clairvoyant, more empathic, more aware of other beings, your ability to learn uh, changes. And uh, one of the most uh, important works attesting to that uh, was written by Go a man named Gopi Krishna. And uh, his works are still in print. Um, fascinating reading that was a man who meditated intensely for 17 years. And after 17 years, he had an explosive kundalini awakening that forever changed him. He literally physically saw things differently. He saw energy fields. He uh, said that he had broken open some genius level of intelligence uh, through this awakening. But he said this is such a powerful energy that few people can handle it very well. And even the physical body cannot handle it very well because it just changes the whole energy structure of the body. So this then becomes a very important, important aspect of our entity contact experience. We have to get away from the ships. We have to get away from this idea that we're just in a genetics program. Um, and I'm, here again, I'm not saying those things are not going on. But we may be missing the biggest picture of all, which as we are being handed gifts of transformation of consciousness on an unprecedented level, on an unprecedented scale, because this is going on all over the world every day from every walk of life. So this is another thing that the uh, experience uh, survey uh, reveals, is that you know the media has tended to marginalize experiencers, that, oh, well, that's those people. There's something really strange about them because they're being abducted, or uh, they're weird, or they're fringe, or they're not us, you know, that sort of message. And guess what? They are us. Experiences are us. They come from all walks of life, all ages. And many of these experiences begin in childhood. Um, and uh, people tend to not talk about them uh, for the ongoing reasons of fear of ridicule, uh, disapproval from family members, or some scientist jumping down your throat and saying it was all in your head. Uh, here, have a pill, sort yourself out. Um, and so they they stay very quiet about it. Now, this was um, a confidentiality guaranteed uh, survey. We don't release the names. There are a few of us who do know the names because we're contacting them for, uh, for further follow-up. So um, we are still collecting uh, surveys. In fact, uh, you can go to our website and take the survey and contribute to the data pool, even though we've clo officially closed phase one and two for the purpose of uh, further analysis. So uh, the respondents also said that they felt the purposes were these connections to the spiritual realm uh, and even connections to the afterlife. This was a very significant thread that, that people felt that somehow um, ETs and aliens had something important 
um, some important connection concerning the afterlife, our concept of the afterlife, and also the, the place where uh, you know, the dead obviously are, and also reincarnation, that they were tied in uh, with um, a series of lifetimes, uh, even if people hadn't previously believed in reincarnation. And that, uh, not surprisingly, they felt more spiritual as a result of their experiences, but not necessarily religious. In fact, a significant portion of them said they felt it was no longer important to go to church. Now that's very important too, because religion is a monolith on this planet. And you can imagine what would happen uh, to order, to social order, if religion is upset uh, and um, if, um, if governments are upset. And uh, you know, we have a lot of talk about disclosure. People were in disclosure. We are in disclosure every day with people having experiences. None of us need a pope or a president to tell us whether or not we are having contact, because we are. <laughs> Stephen Bassett, bless you. I love your work and keep pushing. But uh, you know, we, we officially are in contact, and we have been throughout human history. So let's own up to it and uh, recognize what's going on and, and figure out how we can make use of it. Uh, the aspect for religion is, um, you know, that's a, a serious matter because uh, people um, revolve their lives around their faith. And uh, I got into this uh, back on my uh, table there. I have a book called Talking to the Dead that I did with George Norrie, which is about a technology for communicating with the afterlife. And we deal with the question of religion, that if you can prove the afterlife beyond the shadow of a doubt, and what it's like, even though the dead have been telling us for hundreds of years what it's like, uh, but if you can prove it you know, to, um, to the satisfaction of society and science, and it doesn't match what religion teaches us, what are the implications of that? And what are the implications to science of contact experience? Because many scientists are telling us all, this still isn't real. Uh, it's real because it doesn't fit certain known laws, uh, even from, uh, from a physics perspective. So uh, these sorts of things, and they are subjective. You see, that's the problem. They're subjective experiences. They can't be replicated. We can certainly find patterns in these experiences, but uh, still a stepchild of science. Uh, I think that, uh, here's my theory, and I call it transreality Earth, and I've been talking about this for a few years that we are moving into transreality Earth, and this uh, survey uh, underpins that in a very dramatic way. And transreality Earth is a different reality than what we're living in now. The yogi masters, uh, Pierre, uh, Pierre uh, Teilhard de Chardin talked about it, the great mystics and philosophers have all talked about a future Earth which is paraphysical, that is, we are united with some higher level of consciousness and it changes us physically. We no longer need a physical body. The Ascension people call that the light body. Uh, Deschardins called it the noosphere, uh, aligning with the planetary consciousness. Um, Sri Aurobindo called it uh, the supermind, where we transcend uh, physical death and acquire a state of being beyond that. Uh, but we're in this right now, and we're in it because of our experiences. We are in it because we are global now. And we have technology that unites us globally all the time. So we have thought forms and consciousness that travel the planet. Uh, talk about faster than speed of light, it's speed of thought. Because at any given moment, we can react collectively to anything, and a thought form uh, is created that has energy, it has momentum, it has tangibility. And uh, so as we unite globally with our thoughts and our feelings, and especially our feelings, because that's the electricity that all this stuff runs on, um, we are changed physically by that, and our physical environment is changed by that. So our uh, experiences are changing us now. And the more we realize that collectively, the faster the change is going to occur. And it's already occurring uh, as more people talk about their experiences. Uh, as we see the scope of contact with alternate realities that's already present in the world, that encourages more people to invest some kind of belief in it, to talk about their experiences, which in turn validate other experiences. And we, uh, pretty soon we have a pool of consciousness that is oriented toward alternate reality. 
which means alternate realities open up more and we have neighbors. Now a lot of these neighbors I don't feel are extraterrestrial, I believe they are interdimensional. Uh, that is, they come from right here on Earth, they just vibrate at a different rate of speed. And uh, we have these experiences when the doorways come open, the portals come open. Uh, whether they are mysterious creatures or ETs or Bigfoot, angels, uh, spiritual guides and masters, ETs, um, they all come through these uh, interdimensional doorways. Uh, I think Sam mentioned that they don't really change play, uh, they don't really travel, uh, they just change location. And I, I think that's the case, you know, that they're already here, they just manifest uh, to us. So we are moving into this trans-reality uh, Earth, and it's already happening. It's not something that's going to happen tomorrow or the next lifetime or for our kids. We're in it now, so how are we going to affect it? And the downside of it is we can be manipulated uh, through our global consciousness by corporations, conglomerations, military, government, um, intelligence, you name it. Uh, algorithms follow global thought forms all the time to, to predict how people are going to respond to situations and how they're going to react. In other words, how we can be managed. And so we, we need to be very mindful of how we are using our consciousness, our thoughts, uh, what we are participating in. Uh, we're cell phone addicted. We're all guilty of that. Um, we're addicted to technology and distracted by it, and yet it could be our greatest ally in maintaining our sovereignty, free will, and self-determination for the uh, independence of the soul, and that's what we're talking about here. Now, I think there are plenty of entities out there who would uh, like to uh, subjugate that soul energy, and uh, mystics, philosophers, and yogis have all talked about that throughout the ages, too. Uh, or, uh, no, Robert Monroe, who um, pioneered out-of-body travel research, called them the louche harvesters, that is, uh, they would harvest the vital, that there were hostile forces on the astral plane that would harvest the vital energy of human beings, which he called louche, and use it for their own purpose. In other words, steal a piece of your soul. And so these things go on. There is a dark side to it. So uh, if we are going to enter this trans-reality Earth where uh, some wonders of the cosmos uh, begin to open up to us, um, riding on this high energy of love and oneness where we have more frequent counters with non-human intelligent beings. We become self-determined players in this field rather than perceived victims in it. We are going to have to be very, very conscious of how we use our minds. And uh, I think that's one of the things that this uh, study points to very dramatically. Going to end with this, we are currently uh, raising funds for some documentaries. One of them is going to focus on the work of Dr. Ruby Schild and his concept of black holes. Can't wait to work on that one. And the first one uh, is going to be a, uh, about our survey and uh, about how science can bridge um, all of these experiences. These are paraphysical experiences. And uh, I'm deeply involved in this. I'm the script writer uh, for these projects. Uh, we're working with um, Ron James out in Los Angeles. Uh, some of you may know Ron's name. He's been in the field a long time. He's done some outstanding documentaries in the UFO field, including the disclosure dialogues, which he uh, here he is at the uh, International UFO Congress with Jennifer Stein and Alejandro Rojas accepting an EBE award for the Disclosure Dialogues, which he worked with Stephen Bassett on that, on disclosure. Uh, Ron is an outstanding filmmaker with vision, and he's totally on board for everything that uh, we've uncovered in, uh, in this um, initial survey. Um, now, we are championing the quantum hologram theory, and uh, this was uh, very much a favorite of Dr. Edgar Mitchell, and it is of Dr. Schild as well, uh, that um, we're in a hologram reality, uh, reality of vibratory waves, and that experiences are both paraphysical and physical. It's two sides of a coin. It's not that one is real and one is not real, which is what traditional science would tell us. 
they are both real sides of the coin, the paraphysical, and they can be both uh, embraced by and explained by the quantum hologram uh, theory, so that ultimately we can't really separate in our consciousness what is physical and paraphysical. And that's exactly where this trans-reality Earth is going. It's a new awareness of a new reality. And uh, so the film is going to uh, emphasize that, and we have uh, physicists that uh, are going to participate in uh, this experience as well as experiencers. So I'm going to end with the trailer for this documentary. This is our fundraising trailer. And uh, it uh, kind of summarizes all the ideas that uh, are going to be in the film. Thousands of people report eerily similar accounts of near-death experiences. Share stories of contact with otherworldly beings, stories that again bear striking similarities. These kind of accounts are usually dismissed by science, but what if all of it were real? Recently, radical scientific theories have entered the mainstream. Perhaps we live in a holographic universe where all information may be retained within the fabric of space and time. These concepts are now a part of mainstream theoretical physics. Many physicists now say that this new science can explain paranormal mysteries, such as near-death and out-of-body experiences, UFOs and UFO-related entities, ghosts and spirits, floating orbs, ESP, psychokinesis, remote viewing, shamanic journeying, channeling, and more. Many of these scientists proclaim that, in fact, our universe is actually a multiverse that is literally teeming with non-human intelligent life. The Dr. Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Encounters, or FREE, has launched one of the most comprehensive scientific investigations of our time in search of answers. What they are uncovering is extraordinary. Meet the people who are helping to shape the future of human understanding. Join us as we enter the unknown with fresh scientific curiosity. Films and TV shows will change everything. Revelations will astound you. The Free Transmedia Project. It's all happening. Our science isn't adequate at this point to explain all of the experiences. Dr. Mitchell, I might add, uh, you know, he passed away recently in February, and he was uh, quite active in free uh, right up until his passing. He was very passionate about um, this mission that we have to fulfill. And uh, I'm quite excited, especially to be working on the film projects, because that is one of the best ways to reach the most number of people. Now, for all of you who uh, are interested in delving into this uh, on a more in-depth basis, this is our website, it's experiencer.org. And uh, if you would like to plow through the thousands of pages of this survey, you are more than welcome to because we have published all of our findings. They are publicly available. This is not an organization that takes in information and gives nothing out, as some of them do, uh, and some of them have in the past. Uh, so uh, the survey results are all there, as well as some scientific papers um, on the uh, quantum hologram theory, the structure of our organization, uh, the survey, if you want to take the survey yourself, you're more than welcome to. And we have support programs. We have um, uh, therapy support for people who have been traumatized by their experiences. We have a network of therapists all over the country. We have a buddy system for people to talk one-on-one -on -one with other experiencers. So it's quite an expanding organization. And uh, everything that we do will uh, always be public available. Um, Sue, I have um, just a few minutes before 5. Do you want me to field a few questions or just go straight to the panel? Um, I, I just go to the panel. And can... Ask the questions there. So um, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.